I'm Duncan McLeod, and this is the Tech Central Show. TCS is brought to you by MTN Business, and you can visit them at mtnbusiness.co.za. And we thank them very much for partnering with the show and bringing you these great interviews. Just a reminder that you can subscribe to TCS on YouTube at youtube.com slash techcentral or simply search Tech Central one word in your favorite podcasting app and you will find all of our shows. Now in the studio today is none other than Andy Higgins, the founder of uh, auction website Bid or Buy and the man behind what Bid or Buy has morphed into today and that's Bob Group. Andy, it's really good to see you. It's been a while. How are you doing? Uh, all good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. The last time we had you on the show was uh, just, just under two years ago now, and that was regarding the launch of Bob Group, which was an amalgamation of Bid or Buy and a business called You Africa. Uh, I think you said at the time that the plan was to create an all-in-one kind of marketplace that, that helps sellers sell goods and services online and handles delivery and inventory management and all the rest of it. Um, How's, how's, how's it gone? How's Bob Group doing? Uh, what have you changed since we last spoke? Yeah, so I think it's the plan has pretty much stayed the same. Okay. Um, it's going well. There's a lot going on in the industry, of course, which makes things very interesting every day. Uh, we still got our five services, the one being the marketplace, formerly Bid or Buy, which is Bob Shop. That's grown over the last year by about 20%. Um, but it's also facing lots, lots of challenges and lots, lots of disruptions within the market. So it's been very interesting. Mm -hmm. And we've uh, one of our newer services, which has taken us longer than we would have liked to get going, mostly because of all the compliance and regulation involved, with, and that's around payments. So that's our Bob Pay service. But I'm super excited about that because I think the market person, I believe, is ripe for disruption. Um, and we hope to be uh, play a part, be one of the disruptors. And then we've got one of our, our more mature which is, uh, business, which is the old U Africa, and that's Bob Go, our courier ag aggregator. Mm -hmm. And that's growing about 30% year on year at the moment. And uh, another very exciting newer service. In fact, I, I think I would have mentioned this last time. Um, and that's our smart locker service called Bob Box. Okay. And we think that, especially in the South African market, there's a lot of opportunity there, um, in particular servicing the, the underserviced e-commerce market in South Africa. Uh, and then our fifth service is going along strongly as well, and that's our software as a service solution for courier companies called ShipLogic, which is growing nicely as well. So, um, I th yeah, there's a there's a company in South America um, called Mercado Libre, a listed company. I think they're mm. valued at something like eighty billion dollars or something crazy. Um, we've looked at their success, and and to, to a large degree, we we trying to sort of replicate where we can what they, their success that they've had in South America here yeah, because we think there's a lot of parallels. Funnily enough, I was just reading about that company the other day. They're um, based in Uruguay, aren't they? Yeah, Yes, I think uh, legally based in Uruguay, yeah. but obviously the bigger market's been uh, Brazil and Argentina yeah. and also in Mexico and a few, few other South yeah. American countries, yeah. so Latin yeah. America. Okay, so Bob Pay. Tell me a bit more about Bob Pay. So Bob Pay, so of course um, I have my roots and payments from, from my involvement in PayFast from uh, mm. when, we, when I was involved with starting that with Jonathan Smith in 2007, but exited that business in 2019, so it's been five years. So um, You've done your gardening leave. Yes, uh, I feel, <laughs> feel that way. Um, for me, probably uh, one of the most exciting aspects is the introduction of PayShop, mm -hmm. and I think we can leverage that to make a difference I mean, again, looking at South America, it seems to come up quite a bit now. In Brazil in particular, they have um, a very similar service called PIX, which now has, in, in just in a matter of a few years, has overtaken uh, by number of transactions, overtaken card, credit and debit cards combined in Brazil. Now, uh, PIX uh, processes more transactions than, than, than card combined uh, in total. So um, it can change very quickly. Um, I think in, in South Africa, we've got a few challenges there to overcome as well. And for once, it's not the, in my view, at least from, from my perspective where I'm, uh, I'm sitting, it's uh, not government. Uh, I think uh, in particular, the Reserve Bank and BankServe in particular, they've been very proactive um, mm. from my perspective in, in, in trying to get this out. And the, the bigger obstacles um, have become more from the private sector, from the banks themselves, who are pushing back a bit, I think, trying to protect uh, protect there's some of their legacy income, right. which I think we're very quick to criticize government, often us in the private sector. But I think yeah. in, in this case, it, it seems like it's the banks that are, 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 are being more of a uh, holding it back. That's interesting. Do you think the, the banks are wrong to impose fees on pay shop transactions? Look, I, I, th I think they can impose fees, a reasonable fee. Um, 
And for me, I think it's wrong personally to impose it on the on the consumer. I think in in our world, in the e-commerce world, it's 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 accepted that the merchant can pay a fee for a transaction, mm-hmm. and I think that's fine. In this case, I think it should should be in relation to their costs, which we know with PayShap, um, the that's cost right. base is much much lower. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I think it should be for for to really get the adoption it deserves it should be free for a consumer okay yeah. interesting we've seen um, companies like meta with whatsapp launching instant payment services in instant messaging apps like whatsapp in brazil india and i think some other markets mm-hmm. potentially as well now uh, are you seeing that as an opportunity in south africa sort of whatsapp or instant messaging based payment solutions or absolutely i think yeah. more general for e-commerce is uh, people are already using it it's just a bit clunky right and i think um once those services become available, it just become streamlined and it, it will just grow even faster. I think we underestimate actually how much um, e-commerce actually takes place informally through things like through social media, social mm. commerce sometimes it's referred mm. to. Mm. Okay. Uh, so when, when can we look out for Bob Pay? When do you think it's going to be ready? Well, um, we've already launched it. Uh, um, it's, it's available uh, okay. at the moment, but it's um, PayShap hasn't gone live yet. We hope to go live with – we actually hope – to be certainly one of the first to go live, if not the first, if we can if we can get there. It's certainly not a technical limitation at the moment. Is there a bit of a race going on? Um, I'm, I assume there is. I'm not really aware. I assume some of the other payment gateways must be implementing it as well. Um, but we're we're ready to go. We're just waiting for approval from our partner bank, and, okay. and then we we're ready to to start testing it. Um, but that is sort of phase one. It's what they call pay by proxy. So it's still also not going to be the best user experience. And we expect by October this year for additional functionality to be in place called request to pay. And that will be a much better user experience. Mm-hmm. And it will also allow currently the where the banks charge, which is most of the banks charge the consumer fee. There'll still be that fee now, which makes it less attractive than using other payment methods like right. card. Right. But when we get request to pay, it will be reverse billed to the, to, to the merchant. Uh-huh. And I think it's going going to be uh, make much more sense then from an e-commerce perspective yes but we want to get going as soon as we can you know? okay interesting what, what else is uh, coming from bob group in the next little while well the other exciting th- project for me it's, it's it's all the new shiny stuff right but um uh, it's it's our, our smart locker system mm-hmm. which we've you know we we we, we, we We've done a lot of research around it. We even hired some expensive consultants to advise us, and their advice was strongly not to build our own locker solution. Because okay. There's many solutions available that you can purchase, not in South Africa but around the world. And you know, being the tech technology focused company we are, and a bunch of geeks, we couldn't resist, and we <laughs> we we've ended up embarking on a process over the last um, almost two years now of building our own solution, uh, manufacture, uh, d- designing the, the hardware, the, the firmware, all of that locally and, and having the, the, the actual physical lockers manufactured locally as well through a, through a partner. Um, and that's allowed us to do it, We've we based on the information we have, at about 20% of the cost of a, what it would have cost us to, to import well. a solution. And, of course, g- gives us much more control over it. So um, we've also made it South African proof, we think. Um, okay. We've tried. It's not relying on external uh, power supply. It runs off a battery. Okay. Um, we... Um, we're using a very cool um, Internet of Things protocol for the communication called MBOIT. We partnered with Vodacom on that. Okay. Um, and, and it's a it's a new technology that allows you it's low low power, low bandwidth, um, but allows us to be sort of um, real time on online, being able to update to communicate with our lockers out in the wild. So. Um, from a tech point of view, it's been a, a very fun and interesting, but also challenging product. A, a product we, we, you know, we used to building software as a company. Mm. This is the first hardware project we've taken on, which obviously, you know, tends to have longer iteration cycles yeah. and other challenges that you that you just don't think of. That and then when you need to update something, it, it tends to take longer. So, we're very excited about the the lockers. Um, in some countries in Europe. Obviously, they're different markets, um, and and population makeup and all of that is different. And how people live, how, how mm. dense housing is, and that sort of thing makes a difference. But in a country like Poland, something like eighty percent of e-commerce deliveries are made to lockers. Oh, wow! Wow! Eighty yeah. percent. Yeah. Wow. So um, there is obviously an educational thing there as well. Uh, 
But where, where's the opportunity? Is it in townships? Is it in shopping centres? Where, where, where are you going to deploy so, these? So, so uh, uh, the answer is all over. But mm -hmm. I'm particularly excited about the opportunities in, also in in the more like, in like townships and, and places like that. Um, I mean, we've still got a long way to go. We've we we've got 70 locations at the moment. Um, only in Gauteng, Cape Town. Identified the, Ford rollout or no, really, really rolled deployed. Out, active, wow. live. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. You guys don't mess around. No, no. Um, <laughs> and we're hoping to up that. Yeah, we're setting quite ambitious tar tasks. I don't know if I, uh, um, our, our target for next year is, is to reach 1,000 locations by the end of next year. Wow. And we believe we can do it because, well, us, our solution now is at least uh, stable, we believe. And we can roll out, you know, having the local manufacturing, we can roll out quite quickly. The lead times for us are, are, are quite low now. Okay. Um, so, yes, I, I think it's, it's, it's petrol station forecourts. It's uh, shopping malls. We ha have one in, in the residential state where I live, and that's working well. Um, business parks. Uh, that, that's lockers. Uh, I should also mention we also do counters. So that's more a solution like a Paxi or a Pargo. Mm -hmm. um, we are very much focused on the lockers, but we think they can work, ha should work hand in hand with counters as well. Uh, in, in Europe, they refer to that as PUDO, pick-up drop-off points, mm -hmm. which is also very popular. There's, most countries now have thousands of points yeah. you know, nationwide. Um, so, yeah, so we think, you know, it's also the cost of deliveries in particular into townships. Mm -hmm. It, it's it's you know there's surcharges that get typically charged mm. by couriers, mm. and so I personally believe that's when we're going to get the real breakthrough in e-commerce in this country is when we can make e-commerce accessible to to the entire population. Yeah, and then it makes sense also for rural areas, right? For for you know mm. if you live out on a farm or somewhere, generally you would or knows have someone who's going into town mm -hmm. you know once a week or whatever the case is and you can you know you can go and pick up your parcel then and i think it, it's going to help to drive e-commerce out in the in the more outlying areas as well fascinating is there good money in in rolling out lockers no, or is no, it a tight so margin business that's a I good imagine. question you ask <laughs> um we do look at those numbers every day and we ask ourselves why are we doing this sometimes because financially it is very challenging to get right so it's really a numbers game mm. and it's all about consolidation as well and so we think. Uh, so, so we also launching an app um, b before the end of this year. It'll be a consumer app, a bar box consumer app. And so you'll be able to book your shipment on the app. Anyone shipping anything from, uh, well, as long as it fits in the locker from A to B. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and I think to some extent you could argue the the the, the demise of the unfortunately the demise of the South African post postal service in this country. Uh, there is actually we actually have an opportunity there more than other countries because there is a need for for, for even outside of e-commerce for people to ship things mm. um, and at uh, cost effectively. And so, in order for this model to work financially, we believe we have to go quite broad. But what we also our model is not. Um, it's what we would call career agnostic model. So we're not becoming a career company ourselves. We we want to build this network of lockers, and we want to open it up. And because we we you know we believe we're good at the tech, yeah. we think we're well positioned to do that. We want to open it up to many different careers who can use it because we think it doesn't make sense, for example, for for you know ten different career companies to have their own locker um, outside a, a residential estate, for example. So we want to be sort of provide that infrastructure, that network, and then enable any other career who wants to tap into that to be able to use it. And that's also how we hope to get to the scale we need to make it work okay. financially. <laughs> Do you think there's any role for the post office in e-commerce in South Africa or has that, that ship sailed? No, definitely. I mean, my dream personally actually would be to do a public private partnership with the post office. And I was encouraged seeing, you know, with the changes happening and the communication ministry, I think they've even indicated that, that that's the, the direction they would favor going. So if anyone, if, I, if you have contacts with the new minister of communication, <laughs> I'm, I'm here. I think we have the best solution, um, how we can actually um, work together with the post office to provide an, an excellent solution, not only for e-commerce, but for postal services across the country. Yeah, okay. love to do that. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Sally Malatsu, if you're watching the show, give me a call. Yeah. <laughs> this is the man you want to speak to. Let's switch gears a little now, Andy. Let's talk about the e-commerce market in South Africa more broadly, because I think since the last time we spoke, a lot has happened. Mm -hmm. Um it was it was already shifting in that direction. I think when, when we spoke in September of twenty two, we were two years into the COVID pandemic, which obviously had a big impact on the market as well, and I think drove a lot of people to think about shopping online for the first time. And I think a lot of those customers probably stuck around 
post COVID. Is that the experience you had as well? That um, that a lot of people perhaps dabbled in e-commerce for the first time said, "Hey, this actually works quite well. I'm going to continue doing it." Look, I, I think if we if we look certainly at our stats, we got that spike during COVID um, and and shortly and after COVID as well. But it has more in my from what I can see uh, normalized, more reverted to its original growth. Okay. Um, at least looking back, um, mm-hmm. what happens forward? Uh, looking forward is another thing. But it, so you had this spike, and then it it sort of normalized to the. To, to, to the people I think sort of did resort back to their old ways somewhat yeah, yeah. from what we can see. Okay. Okay. Um, but there, there definitely has been a, a solid growth in, in the last few years. And in fact, I was just looking at some recent research from uh, worldwide works, Arthur Goldstock's um, research firm that showed that e-commerce is growing and has reached 6% or reached 6% of retail sales in South Africa in 2023. And, um, and Arthur said that figure is expected to breach the 10% mark sometime in 2025 um what's driving this growth do you think what are the what are the the underpinning uh, factors that are propelling people to shop online instead mm. of going into a retail store look i think it's it's a, i don't know for sure but it i imagine it's a few factors one of them is that south africa has just been so far behind the others mm. other countries right if you look even at the other emerging markets they're all were already well above 10 percent. so i think there's a certain degree of catch-up and COVID did help accelerate that um so, 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 so there's that. I think the competition has definitely helped um, in in the the different, in particular, um, the Chinese players. I think it's okay. it's it's helped accelerate that. Um, and so, people have become more comfortable with putting their credit card in on online and shopping online. And yes, and, and and I actually think even the likes of of six, Checker sixty sixty yeah. uh, on demand delivery. I think I think yeah, people have experienced that, and 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 that I think has had some spillover effect into the broader e commerce as well. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, I th- I, my guess is it's mostly catch up though, and and people are finally um, realizing you know. Ha- ha- the benefits of shopping yeah. online. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned Shaker sixty sixty, obviously a huge success, mm-hmm. um, and and many companies try to emulate what they've done in that space. How, how important is on demand delivery in the e commerce context in South Africa? Do you see this becoming the primary way that people shop online? I I need a new microwave. I want mm-hmm. it in the next hour. I think for for mainstream items that's true, but I mean for me, where e commerce really comes into its own is is with the long tail, right? So it's the choice. People shop online for. Pro- Research shows for primarily three reasons. One yeah. is price. Second is choice or, or variety, and third is convenience. Mm. So on demand, on demand, I think it's the convenience, um, and I think that will drive it and continue to drive it. But I mean, if you're looking for something that's not, you know, that common, it's not a sort of a, a commodity or a mainstream item. The chances are it may be available in the country, but not at a at a at a location where it can be delivered to you. In within uh, one hour or whatever the case may right. be, so I think it's multifaceted from that point of view, and I think the the both will sort of feed off each other and, and fuel the growth, and both will be okay. important. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now you mentioned the Chinese uh, vendors; they, they they're not only impacting our market, but in America, Western Europe, uh, mm. lots of concern, particularly about Shine or Shane. I'm never sure, quite sure how Sheen. to pronounce Shine oh. <laughs> and Temu. Um, and we've seen objections in the South African market from the likes of TFG, Take a Lot, which of course owns Superbolist, and other companies being very critical of the way these companies are allegedly exploiting loopholes in the mm-hmm. local South, South African tax codes. Um, do the critics have a point? Uh, totally, uh, mm-hmm. I, I think so. Um, I mean, those rules that they they are, are exploiting, you could argue, are from pre sort of internet days even. So. Right. Okay. Um, I yeah, don't they call them the de, de minimis yes. regulations or codes, uh, which which just explain it to me. They, it's based on a, a minimum. So I think it's it it was based to reduced admin, right? So mm. if you if if a, if a, if a individual or small company imports something for say under five hundred rand, um, the the admin of trying to collect the the VAT and right. duties on that. Um, you know, is, is greater than than the benefit of of that income. But now, when you've got uh, a, a company like Timu that's effectively importing, arguably, it, it could be in the billions of rands of, of goods. Collectively, th- that situation is, is different now. And, and even worse so, they now, you know, competing against 
other local um, importers who maybe imported in bulk, mm. and, and they were they had to pay those VAT and duties. So it's not a fair playing field. So there's definitely a point there. Um, but but how to fix it is, is also challenging because you know these, there's obviously systems in place um, that aren't aren't designed to deal with with yeah. this sort of thing. Yeah, and, and can enforce- SARS cope? Can customs cope with uh, having to analyze every package that's coming to the country? No, I don't think they value? can. But uh, I mean, so so they 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 have a um, like a a program that you can enroll as as a private you know as private sector companies can enroll into and you get accreditation they call it an AO accreditation and so essentially i believe they will they, they will they do and they will continue to pass that responsibility on to other sort of um forwarding agents and importers right and it, and and they will do so I will end up doing spot checks to make sure that okay. they that that they are doing things correctly but ultimately i think the responsibility will fall on these on the sort of forwarding agent yeah yeah i suppose it'd be unfair to me ask you whether you think the tariffs are correct and whether the industry I, needs protection. I can tell you they're not correct because yeah. I've done some orders myself from yeah. overseas and and um and I've the fees I've been charged are are clearly incorrect because they below ten percent and VAT alone is fifteen oh, percent right? right. So yeah. even if there was no duty as far as I can tell, it looks incorrect. Yeah. I was thinking more about um, whether we should be trying to protect our local textiles uh, industry. Uh, um Oh, uh, so I, I'm definitely for um, free trade, and um, uh, but yeah. You know, so my personal view would be to, as long as it's a fair playing field, so it wouldn't be fair that Mr. Price gets taxed in one yeah. way when they import in bulk, but um, the individual, the individual importing a single item via Sheen does mm. not. To me, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fair enough. Um, what, what impact do you think? I mean, companies like Temu and, and Sheen. Uh, operate mainly offshore. They've got local fulfillment uh, partners. I believe they both work through a company called Buffalo. Um, uh, are we going to see more of this, more Chinese players coming in, uh, perhaps players from other markets starting to compete with local retailers, but not actually setting up a, a presence in the country? Um, and, and how do you think that's going to impact the market in the longer mm. term? I think what will probably have to happen is, I think there will be certain um, products that lend themselves towards that. Um, not everything. So you're sort of, Many of your mainstream brand products uh, will still go through more traditional supply chains, and I don't think that will be as affected. But certainly, things like uh, clothing and apparel, as we've seen, and other um, sort of more generic uh, type type products, yeah, uh, will still. Uh, I, th- I think the. I think it, it. It. I think what will have to have to happen, in my opinion, is local players will have to adapt and perhaps even just uh, start. Uh, you know, set up their own. Ways of I think um, I think actually Zando's already done that where mm. they will actually um, also offer imported goods. Um, so yeah, if you can't beat them, okay. join them, sort of thing. Okay, I think, but I, I don't think it's a clear. You know that that's that's going to shift. Everything is going to go that way because um, you know still you're if you're going to buy a Samsung TV or something like mm. that. That's that you're not going to buy that from a Chinese retailer. No, right? no. <laughs> it's interesting to see Amazon said it's also looking at uh, yes. launching a, yes. a low cost portal or tab on its website even us for on bob shop we're experimenting with it we enable have enabled a few select sellers to ship directly from china to their customer in south africa using buffalo logistics so um and that seems to be working quite well so i think that's going to be a bit of a hybrid right Mm. right interesting interesting and i wanted to ask you about the competition commission's recent findings they did i forget the full name of the investigation they did it had a very long Mm. name online what is it called? In online intermediation yes. markets and yes. or something like that. Um, but they came in for a bit of flack um, where it was suggested that um, they were punishing take a lot in particular uh, and um, that it wouldn't apply to Amazon because Amazon wasn't in the market at the time and that's unfair. What, what is your take of, on the Competition Commission's draft findings and do you think that it's even warranted that the Competition Commission is, in, is interfering in a market that is still relatively new and mm. and still a tiny portion of the overall retail market. Yes, I think that's a very good point. The fact that, as you said, e-commerce is at best 6%. I'm not sure if it's even that high at the moment, but it's, let's say it's round about there. Okay. So, yes, so it's a question of, of you know, it sh- should our online have so much scrutiny when it's such a small part of the overall market? I think it's valid. I also think it probably was initiated 
before all the new competition came into the market as well, because I think since they, they would have initiated that, 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 that investigation, a lot has changed. Mm. And so I imagine they, my, I'm not sure, I don't have any inside information, but they probably will back off a bit because I think natural markets, um, um, it has, it has, it has, has markets already moved on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's, there's, I think there's, it's no, no longer that take a lot is, is if, if they ever were this threat mm. of dominating the space because clearly they're not. They've got there's a lot of competition there already. Mm. Not, and I'm not talking offline now. I'm talking online. So I actually think it's it's a little bit moot now because because natural elements within the market have taken care of it as far as I'm concerned. And so I think there's less reason for, for the Competition Commission to be concerned um, whether it was justified in the first place or not. Mm. I think I think there were, um, if you looked at other markets, there were there are signs that, where you could look there where, where, where there was one big dominant player and there, and there could have been cases where they abused their position. Mm-hmm. So I think there is some scope for it, in particular when that player is a first-party seller and a third-party seller, so, so where they sell their own goods and they, they they provide a platform for other sellers, to, especially small small businesses, to sell. I think there, there I think there is a good argument for some regulation to be put in place to protect those smaller sellers, including here in South Africa. Including here in South Africa. I mean, I think as, even if it's as a preemptive measure, because you could see what what's happened in other markets. Okay. So it's not clear cut in my mind, but um, I actually think it's it's. I imagine if. If I was the competition commission, I'd be less concerned about abuses because because there is so much natural competition now mm. already. And mm. It's probably going to only intensify moving forward. What would you like to see from the competition commission? What what do you think they should be doing in this space? Um, Beyond what you've just mentioned, of course. Yeah, uh, I don't. Uh, well, I, th- I, th- I think probably more of a hands off approach would be my sort of more right. more, more approach. Let the market develop. Yes. Before yes. you start to regulate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say so. <clears throat> I would. I would love to, on the payment side, for them to be more <clears throat> proactive on, on ensuring that the, the the banks allow the new tech to come in and, mm-hmm. and allowing that to take off. Yeah, but on the e-commerce side, I think. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about Amazon. Um, when did they launch? Now was it May? Seventh of May, I think it was. It's May. Yeah. So it's yeah. been in the market just over two months now. Um, I think people were expecting a lot from Amazon when it mm. launched in the local market, and I think uh, that may have led to a lot of inflated expectations. Certainly, they haven't um, shot the lights out. Um, I, I must admit, I went on there the day it was launched and placed an order and tested it out, so did and I, I've, I've hardly been back. Mm. Uh, I have go, I go back occasionally, and nothing much cha- changed. And I and I've kind of gone back to my old shopping routines online and Amazon isn't on that mm. list. Do you think it's a flop? Uh, no, I wouldn't call it a flop. I think, I think it's, it's the partly the media to blame. They, they created this, I believe, unrealistic expectation and maybe just general consumers in general who maybe have experienced Amazon, Amazon.com and Amazon.co.uk mm. created this in their mind, this ex- expectation. As far as I'm aware, nowhere did Amazon South Africa themselves ever um, say you know what was going to happen or, or create any hype themselves in fact I think if anything they downplayed it mm. it was external parties that created that expectation right um, and if you look at where they've launched in other markets markets I don't think from as far as I'm aware they've gone with great fanfare mm. um, in, in the beginning in any of those markets and so why uh, you know, there's no reason why that should be any different in South Africa so um, yeah, I personally was always a bit skeptical when people expected this overnight miracle, it mm. seemed, to take place. Um, and I think it's exacerbated even more so by the fact that, you know, if you look at other international players that have come into our market and I think you could say dominate our market in areas like, like, like search with Google, social media like Facebook and even Netflix in the, mm. in the streaming business. Um, for me, there's one big difference there in that those services are purely digital Whereas here, when we talk e-commerce, for the most part, you actually there's a physical product involved, which adds much more complexity to the process. You've physically got to get that product in this country. You've got to ship it internally. There's all these other elements involved, which make it far more challenging. And therefore, I think it, um, it's going to make it take much longer before um, you, you start seeing you know, them, them having an impact. For sure, the, the Chinese players like Timo and Sheen have had a much bigger impact in the last year mm. than, than Amazon by a long way. Yeah. Mm. 
I, th- I think one of the things that surprised many people, and I, I was among them, was that um, they launched without any Amazon products. So, you know, all their smart home products and their smart speakers and all those sort of branded mm. Amazon products, which which are available, ironically, on Take A Lot and other online platforms, were not available, and <laughs> as far as I know, are still not available on Amazon.co.za. They did say when they announced that they were going to launch in South Africa, they'd also be launching Amazon Prime here, that there's no sign of that launching yet. Um were you surprised at the limited range that Amazon offered at launch? Um, yeah, I, th- I think any normal person probably would have expected at least the, the Kindles and the yeah and the uh, Echoes and those sort of things to be available. Um, so yes, that was a surprise, um, but also not as much for me because I know what is involved to uh, um, logistically mm. to make that happen and support those, those yes. products. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I'm sure it will come. It'll come. Uh, and but Prime, do you think Prime will come as well? At some I think point? it will come as well. But I, again, I think it's going to take longer than most people expect. Um, yeah, it's 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 challenging. And and how do you, you know, like you mentioned before about surcharges into townships and you, you know things like that that mm. that maybe are not as applicable in other markets, um, and they are using third party couriers. You know, so um, you, you need to figure out how do you factor all that into the model? It's, and I think one of the challenges Amazon would have, I'm just uh, speculating here, mm. but I mean, they're, they're having to fit into uh, software and a system that's been built for other markets for the most part, I imagine. And I, th- I think it would be quite hard to get specific customizations made to how their system works for, mm. for you know, South Africa, which would make up a fraction of, of, of their business. And so they would have to make what they've got work for South Africa somehow. And I can just see challenges all over in, in mm. getting that right. And uh, I, I think uh, many South Africans tend to think, um, well, it's Amazon, it's Netflix, it's, you know, the grass is greener on the other side. Those guys are these global brands. They know how to do it better. But we've actually got some very smart retailers in this country, don't we? I mean, Amazon is not going to have a walk in the park here, e- even if it came in with everything and did mm. everything immediately. It's going to face the resistance. Take a lot of smart guys, um, Bob, Bob Group's doing amazing stuff. Um, but there are a lot of retailers, both online and traditional legacy, if I can call them that, physical retailers who really do know this retail game. And do you think, um, do you think maybe Amazon perhaps underestimated the, the vo- volume of competition in South African market and the sophistication of the local market? Um, I, I imagine they would have had some insights. Um, I'm sure they're very thorough and would have done their research. Sure. And they would have experienced, for example, in India and other countries as well, lots of competition, um, even to the extent of the likes of of, of Walmart through mm. Flipkart in India, right? Uh, with lots of investment. And of course, in South Africa, we have um, uh, Mass Mart, which is owned, uh, also owned by Walmart now. Uh, so I, I think they would have gone in with their eyes wide open mostly. Yeah. But I imagine they would have been um, uh, surprised more by the, 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 the logistical on the ground operational challenges that they face. That right. would be my guess. Okay. Okay, interesting. You mentioned Walmart and and, and MassMart. Um, uh, do you see them big, being a big player in e-commerce in this country? Yeah, I think uh, Take a Lot, uh, Amazon, um, yeah, uh, MassMart. You've got the Chinese contenders. Of course, Bob Group is tr- we're trying to do our thing as well. Uh, I, I think yes. I, I think they, they they all have big ambitions and have a lot of resources behind themselves. Mm. So. Um, Big fight coming. I think so. Yeah, I think it's already here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, how, how does the, how's this all going to play out, Andy, in the next few years? What, what, put put on your look into your crystal ball and, and tell us where you think this is all going. If, yeah, if I was to have a guess, I think there's going to be multiple players that will end up being successful, and maybe some will find more of a niche than others right. in certain areas. But I also, having said that, I think there will be effectively one winner. I think I think the nature of of a in particular marketplace yeah. where you know you have this network effect and the buyers go where the sellers go and the sellers go where the buyers go uh, where the, you know I think it tends to form and this is where I think there is some legitimacy in the competition commission keeping an eye on this mm-hmm. it tends to form a bit of a natural mono- monopoly and then that um, can create opportunity for abuse so I think even though there, there will be multiple players if you look again like at Brazil there's something like eight successful marketplaces in Brazil. Mm-hmm. But Mercado Libre is the dominant one. Dominant one. So I think you will. I think something similar will, will end up happening here. And Do, if I were to have a guess, yeah. 
uh, I think that will probably be end up being take a lot. Take yeah. a lot, not okay. Amazon. Based okay. on based on yeah, that's my gut feeling. Because of their early entry into the market and their yeah, understanding local, of the market. Yes, they, and mm. I mean they, they have and their logistics in particular. I mean something like that could change. I guess an Amazon could come and and buy a local logistics company, right? And I think mm. that could change the the game completely. But take a lot, for example, own Mr. D and have built up that business over many years and have, you know, a, a very large um, local operation mm. and then all the knowledge and the experience and obviously not don't lack resources and having NASPAS as a… As yeah. And Amazon, Amazon is, is clearly working through third-party logistics firms, whereas mm-hmm. take a lot um, has seen it as important to control that logistics. Exactly. Value chain, is does that… Mean does that lead to take a lot of winning in the end because they control the logistics? How important is that? I think it's critical. I think the logistics is the most critical. There's many aspects in order to operate successfully in the e-commerce space, but I think logistics is the most important. So it's for sure a huge opportunity. <laughs> um, but I mean, in other markets, Amazon have built their own logistics infrastructure as well. So it's not unheard of. So yes, yeah, so it mm. could happen in South Africa. I th- I think it's a long way off though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Always good to talk to you, Andy Higgins. Andy Higgins is MD of Bob Group. Thanks for sharing your insights on the e-commerce market and uh, look forward to seeing how this market develops in the coming years. Thanks, Duncan. Me too.